um, I'd like to start first by appreciating all those that have joined us today. And um, I especially would like to also thank um, the Vice Chancellor of our great university, Professor Inifio Christian Stan, for making it possible for us to broadcast this event live from the Faculty of Science Building, University of Rio. It's really, really fantastic and great. Um, I like to, before I talk about ISA UniU, um, I just like to talk about the why we are gathered here for this event. Um, we, we all agree with me that in Africa and in the, um, Africa and particularly in Nigeria, that there's a little bit of disconnect with disconnect between the industry and the academia. You have researchers um, churning out researches that are not really, really relevant and they are not addressing problems in the industry. And you also have the industry having their challenges without the researchers knowing. And so a part of um, a way of um, ensuring that we strengthen university in the between the industry and the academia. And it started um, before the COVID, which we had um, the CEO of Greenwell Technology, engineer John Udall, who was um, the first speaker. And at the end of the, um, the Faculty of Agriculture, University of York. Okay, so we are sorry for that break in transmission. I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Nam is having some hitches with uh, her internet connection. Okay, I think she's back. No, okay. Are you not seeing my screen? Sorry, please. Yes, Prof, you could share your screen and then uh, continue talking. Yeah, we are with you. Yes, but um, it seems I've not been able to, I've not been enabled to share my screen. So you can do that now, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm like, I said that, um, please, can you, I don't know, I'm not able to share my screen. Okay. You should, you should share now, please. Okay, yes, yes, I'm fine. Okay. So I'd like to thank um, the CEO of um, Clean Energy, um, Owo Basionok, for agreeing to participate in today's forum and also acknowledge um, the Dean of Faculty of Science who will be talking about the research side of things. I'd like to also acknowledge all the professors, the um, DVC here, Professor Godfrey. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, our collaborator, Dr. Leo Daniels from MIT and all other collaborators and partners who are joining us for this meeting. You are all welcome. So I briefly talk about um, ISA UNIU. Um, so at the moment, we are basically exploring um, partnerships and opportunities to strengthen our research and innovation and capability and capacity. So the idea to start this and the center actually started was conceived in 2010 and we were officially approved by the university in 2012. And in 2015, we were able to have the groundbreaking and foundation laying ceremony of our phase one building, which is at the moment a um, work in progress. So we'll appreciate um, industry collaboration like I say, to strengthen our, ca our capacity and our capability. Basically, our vision is to become one of the top innovate innovation centers in the world, which you may, th you may say that, um, think of it as being a very um, tall ambition, but then you know that a journey of 10,000 steps just begins with one step. So we had believing that in the future, we will become one of the top innovation centers in the world. Our mission basically is to be a center of excellence in research, technology, and innovation, particularly delivering scalable and sustainable solutions. 
to challenges in energy and environment in Africa. Our core mandates are as follows. One, we are a center that incubates ideas and innovations from the bigger um, university community and these uh, ideas are being incubated for the market. We, are also, we also have a mandate to transform academic researches into technologies for commercialization. And we are also positioned to be a center where we offer solution to the market and the small and medium enterprises, especially those enterprises without research and innovation capacity. We are also involved in uh, human capacity development, both for the local content and for the national and international. So in the end environment side of things, those are some of the areas that we have um, capacity from EIA to biomonitoring, water technology, remediation, risk assessment. And in the energy side of things, we are into solar technology, biofuel production, waste valorization, biogas technology, and um, bio and nanomaterials. We are strongly linked with a lot of other international centers across the globe, particularly the ones listed there. We, are, we, are, we have as academic partners the Institute of Sustainable and Collaborative Chemistry in Germany, the Guangzhou Institute of Science and Technology in South Korea, the Lancaster Environment Center, Lancaster University. Um, in terms of other bodies, we are strongly affiliated with the American Chemical Society and the United Nations Environment Program. And we have a list of all our other partners, including um, government partners, industry partners. They are well listed on our website. I would like you to visit our website for more information about our partners. And um, yeah, we'll encourage you to visit our website, our email contacts there on the screen and the social media channels are also listed there for information and updates about our center. Particularly, please, we will encourage industries to visit the link there in front of you. We put that link on the chat, um, on the chat place so that um, industry partners can help us complete the industry survey form. We want to hear from the SMEs. We are interested to know their challenges and how we can um, work together to address those challenges. So I again welcome you and I'm sure you are going to enjoy the session today. Please stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, uh, Dr. Edwina, we, we are really grateful for the insight that you've provided. Uh, about the International Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability Research. Um, uh, it looks as if we had some technical issues. We'll be able to share the updated slides with everyone in the call today. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to move on to the next speaker, um, Mr. Owobasi Onuk, uh, who will be presenting today on solar energy in COVID-19 economy. Uh, but before he talks, I would like to briefly introduce Mr. Wobasionuk. So let me share my screen right now and then try to read his profile. All right. So Ogo Basonuk is an energy consultant with more than 12 years professional ex expertise in solar power systems engineering. He is the CEO of Clean Energy, which is a leading solar energy company in Nigeria that has successfully installed solar power systems in more than 15 different states in Nigeria, providing 247 electricity to homes, businesses, commercial buildings, and banks and data centers. We are very, very privileged to have you here, sir, to you know, lead us through uh, today's topic on solar energy in COVID-19 economy. Thank you very much, sir, for, uh, for joining us today and for honoring our invitation. 
and we hope we will learn so much from you. The floor is yours. I think you'll be able to share your screen right after now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I've been looking forward to this presentation for a long time and uh, I'm happy we're finally together. You know, this conversation has um, been very, very, let me just, let me just share my screen right now. Let me share my screen. I want to share my screen right now. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay, very good. Are we together now? Okay, so we're discussing solar energy in a COVID-19 era. Solar energy in a COVID-19 era. This topic has become really, 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 really um, critical because there's a lot of changes that have occurred over the past nine months. And, and as you can see, well, we're going to go to, let me just walk you through the, the, the conversation in general. We're going to look at basic introduction, then we'll discuss the challenges and opportunities of solar energy in this COVID-19 era. And we're going to also look at the solar energy projects in Nigeria. And then we'll discuss what the former speaker talked about, university industry collaborations. And then we'll take as many questions as we can. And by God's grace, we'll we look at the answers together as well. Now, never before in modern history has such a pandemic as COVID-19 disrupted economies globally. As a matter of fact, everything we hold dear has literally been shaken. If you, if you have been in touch with the trends, you will discover that there has been a lot of with organization of various sectors. I mean, the whole world has been shut down for months. We've had to re literally redefine what is really important to our existence here on Earth. And of course, much of the much of the commercial activities have been completely revised. We've seen businesses collapse. We've seen other you know businesses come up, and uh, it's therefore imperative that we understand the solar energy industry in the light of this new COVID-19 era, so as to make strategic and informed decisions about the next generation. And also to forge strategic collaborations and engagement with the university and, 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 all, and uh, so as we can be strategically positioned for the next level of the economy. With the events that have unfolded, any business that is not thinking disruptively might not really survive this era. And, and there are a lot of developments that have come up post-COVID uh, or during the COVID-19 era that has completely revised everything we know about energy. And these are the things that, that i like us to, to discuss, even though very briefly, because I, I understand the time is quite short. Now, what are the challenges? What are the challenges? I, I like to quickly highlight that because with this whole COVID-19 experience, there's been this issue of social distancing. And with the social distancing thing, you're no longer, technically speaking, allowed to hold certain meetings within certain, uh, outside certain numbers of people. So what that has really brought to us as a major new normal is the fact that you're not really going to have that opportunity any longer to always have to have physical meetings with everyone you need to talk with, you know. Of course, most of the time people have issues with phone conversations and all, but the other platforms like the one we're using now have had to become one of the major new, you know, strategic ways of meeting. So with the social distancing thing and all that, people have to now work from home. 
since everything is now dependent on electricity, I mean, for you to be able to even work at home, you need to have you need to have um, the capacity to have energy supply of all the electronic gadgets you have, the whole internet infrastructure in your house, the power system, all of that has to be powered. For instance, I'm currently having this meeting from a solar powered office in, in Delta State. And you, you can imagine that everything is running quite smoothly. Internet is running smoothly. The air conditioner is running. You know, the power system is up. Everything is running. And this is the, the new normal. Most of the times, we, we do not take this thing lightly because if you look at the opportunities that exist right now, there is a critical challenge now to be energy independent. Energy independence has become very, very crucial. Very, very crucial. And these are the opportunities. The first opportunity there is that people are now beginning to realize that Kai, we can no longer depend on NEPA or generator. We can no longer on uh, on uh, another particular source of energy that is not stable. Of course, if you're going to attend such meetings like this, nobody's going to ask you, do you have light in your house or will they bring light by those times to attend? You have to begin to work from home and, and you have to have that energy independence. And this is where solar energy really comes in. Because solar energy gives you that opportunity to be completely energy independent and you can run your, your system. Right now, conversations like this can happen around the globe and people just tune in at different times. You have to have that source of power that, that gives you that possibility. The second opportunity that came up post COVID is that there is a high demand for energy. Due to the high level of remote work, people are now constrained. Before now, if you didn't have light in your house, it probably wouldn't matter. But now you're constrained to have light because if you have to log into a meeting or send reports online, all that stuff is tied to energy. So your energy infrastructure has to be second to none. And, and this is where solar you know, comes in. These are some of the challenges right now because there is this surge in demand. And if we are not strategically positioned to handle that you know, response that people are calling us for solar, then it becomes a challenge. So these are some of the things we need to look at. And then finally, in looking at that, then capacity building becomes critical. And this is where the industry academia synergy you know, is very critical. And that's why we're trying to forge this critical platform. At a very basic level, we have to build sufficient capacity. I'm happy with what the ICSR is doing because there's capacity building at the base of everything. You know, much more than building systems is the need to build human capacity that can you know, if vocational centers can begin to come up, training can begin to happen. People can begin to now think renewable energy. You know, the energy situation is not really getting any better. And all that whole energy crisis is largely tied to distribution networks. When you look at the, the, the solution that solar energy brings, the opportunity that solar energy brings, it completely unclutters the entire distribution network. You don't have to set up any distribution line, literally speaking. What you just need to do is to set up the energy infrastructure at source. And the sun is shining everywhere, for God's sake. So you don't really need to set up a very lengthy you know, distribution web, and then somebody says, oh, transformer has failed, this one is not working. All those kinds of bottlenecks are completely eliminated. Part of the challenge is bedeviling the Nigerian power situation. It's because of the transmission network. Most of the transmission equipment are completely dilapidated. And these are the challenges that be devil. So sometimes you may even have life, but your transformer went back for two, three weeks, you're in that way. But with solar power systems, all that is completely knocked out. So by the time we begin to train people and teach them and guide them tactically to understand, understand uh, the, the opportunities and the prospects, a lot of times, People feel, oh, this solar, is it really working? Can it power my AC? Can it power my washing machine? The truth of the matter is that we need to begin to teach people that, look, solar energy is not something that is just an auxiliary backup. No, it's a full power source. Full power source, you know. And, and these are the things we need to talk about. 
So there's this energy independence opportunity that has come up. Most of the time, if you look at it, most people, when they are building their houses, they, they think they are boreholes, but they now connect to NEPA, and they just give NEPA that space. Okay, you have this NEPA post, all that infrastructure has to be embedded in the plan of the house. But right now, I can tell you, post-COVID, most people are not even interested. I've met with people, they say, I'm building a hotel, I'm not interested in NEPA. We're going to run all the 15 rooms, all the 20 rooms on solar. What kind of air conditioner should I buy? Because they're beginning to realize that, look, it's not really so crucial for you to outsource your energy infrastructure to another, another third party. And, and you know, if you really look at the trends, 70% of rural households are off grid. So what are we talking about? What are we talking about? The grid infrastructure that we even have, that is just serving mostly the urban population, is not even enough to cut up. So at various levels, we need to begin to become energy independent in our thinking. And this is why this conversation is very crucial. I'm going to show you some of the projects that we've been, we've been through and how this uh, clean energy thing came about because our story is a Nigerian story. It's not one of those stories that you can't relate to. I mean, we started this business in 2008 and over the past 12 years, we have had to literally build from a shoestring budget. And you know, much of what has evolved into clean energy today is largely dependent on the shared demand for real solutions. We understood this problem and we tried everything possible to provide service to those people in the rural communities, those cottage hospitals, those places where people have to give birth with the rechargeable lantern. We had to go there. We worked extensively in you know, rural communities like Osuka in Enugu State and various other places, 15 different states in the country. We've met people that they told us, look, you have literally changed my life. Even people that are living in the community that have access to almost constant electricity, they still appreciated the fact, I'm going to show you those pictures, that these solutions have revolutionized their entire system. There are many businesses today that are running. Last, last month, we powered an entire bank of solar, completely running, you know, and, and the system still works. You know, people feel that, oh, bank basis cannot for all that stuff has been relegated to this goal. We've been able to succeed at this level. And today, we have been able to provide the most efficient, reliable, robust, and affordable solar systems in the country. Let me just quickly move to what, you know, what we are about. Because, you know, like I said, this is a Nigerian story, and I'm not one of those uh, stories you can relate to. So one of the things we're committed to is top-notch engineering. Even though we started at some shoestring budget level over the past 12 years. We haven't stopped there. We have continued to redefine the trend. I'm going to show you some of these pictures at the time comes. Because one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm having this conversation is to stir up a strong conviction in your heart to begin to think about what you can do as a young person. Think about what you can do as someone that has the opportunity to live in a country where 200 out of 200 million people over, over, over how many million do not have access to electricity? These are the opportunities that are being asked. And this is one of the things that we try to catch it. So we provide top notch engineering and we also try to keep at par with highest international standards. One of the challenges you can tell most of the people that have a lot of phobia about solar is that much of what they have installed have nothing to do with the real deal. They got some cheap stuff. And of course, those things will be really too much. I don't know, they just write up the whole thing. The industry is not that big, I tell you. If you can work with people that have international standards as their core value system, then you're going to have wonderful experience. Of course, 24 hours reliable electricity, customer satisfaction, very important, affordable rates. This is another thing that we've been able to work into our system so that people can actually access these solutions. Now, now this is where I like to just mention a few things, then I'll go back to the main form of our conversation. Our project, our products always undergo stringent quality for introduction using high quality solar panels. We take custom design solutions and give technical support after the These are the challenges in the industry. They need to give that technical support and then design solutions that actually fit into people's energy needs. Now look at this. 
This is dedicated in solar power system. You know, this system has been running for the past three years without any connection to the it. It's powered by an entire as studio complex, one of the largest solar installations in the world. You can see those infrastructures there. And all these things were done, and it still works. Like I said, the focus of my conversation is not just to tell you what we've done, but to open our understanding to understand that look, these things are real. And they're not just some research topic or something. There is something that can possibly disrupt the entire energy matrix of this country if we can develop sufficient capacity. And that's what I'm, I'm driving at right. This is a technical installation, 2017. It was installed and it's running seamlessly. This was installed post COVID. You can see these are office complex that were just built. In the design of the office, we already had solar infrastructure in place, and all of that, you know, was done. This is a 10 kV installation. This is a residential apartment. You can see the design. It runs this house. They don't even bother about electricity bills anymore because with this energy, the entire house, you know, fridge, freezer, all that stuff, running very smooth. Yeah, this is smaller system. You can see that, you know, wonderful design there, which uh, the house has been running for quite a number of years now. Okay, this this is this is a new technology now. Look at this. These are lithium ion batteries. You can see this stuff on the right. You know, this is this is this is a lithium ion battery. This stuff now. Lithium ion batteries are the next generation of energy storage. We've already inculcated that into our design, and it's actually, you know, part of what. We're, we're introducing right now to encourage long term storage. With lithium ion batteries, you have up, over eight years plus, eight years or eight to ten years of storage guarantee, you know, and all of that. Now, this is a, a pharmacy in Delta State running on solar, 10 kV solar. This is another place, this is in Enugu, running an entire house on solar. This is it. This is the 5 kV. This is actually running a, a tailoring shop, just a small shop. The guy was almost got getting out of business, but we met him last time, we said to him, you can solve your power problem. And today, he runs, runs electric iron, all the machines, everything, running beautifully well on this system. This is a residential apartment. I can go on and on and on, look at it, look at it. There are many such installations we've done, you know, and all that. This is another bungalow, 5 kV system, most of these people, we knocked off their entire energy bill and they're just running smoothly. This is in Abuja, in Gizate, running this duplex beautifully well. And um, this is a solar power borehole and treatment plant. And um, yeah, so what are we here for? What is the conversation about? It's about research. It's about university industry collaboration. And that is why we have to have this conversation. I'm really happy with as many of us that were able to come in and, and have this conversation because there is a crucial need to develop capacity and build R&D centers as well as vocational centers across the country that can train and prepare Nigerians for the next level of energy independence. We've heard, we've heard the consistent protest that stems from what would be what would be a classical case of police brutality. And, and, and the whole NSAS protest that is rocking the country right now has begun to snowball into a demand for proper government, a demand for systems to be reactivated. And, and all of these things have a way of tying into the, the challenge of power. And these challenges of power are the solutions, believe me, at our, at, at our fingers. When we can begin to raise capacity, building all these, even though they are vocational centers or maybe R&D centers, there's the research and development at the level of product development, where you begin to develop physical products like batteries, like inverters, like solar panels, all that research is ongoing. But beyond that, or as in addition to that, we still need another level of research where people can actually be trained some of them might just earn a living from just installing solar panels. So when someone has a, a first degree in, in a particular engineering related course, he can take a six month course or a 12 month course in one of these vocational centers and equip himself with a much more intelligent approach to his own engineering and zoom in on some of these issues so that 
we can actually take our youth off the street and put them in some very, very, you know, valuable and critical, you know, positions so that we can actually own the process. As a university, we can set up a, a center that can begin to, you know, collaborate with businesses like us and, and build systems that can train, build capacity, build manpower, and all of that. And these are the things that, that we, are, we, are, we are beginning this conversation about. I don't just want this conversation to end here, but I want it to be moved to the next level. People have been trained in the university. They now come out. They need a little more brushing. Maybe a little vocational you know, center somewhere can be set up. 50 people every three months or every six months can be trained very, very effectively. And this can be released to society to begin to create this possibility. At the moment, I need to say that uh, our capacity in Nigeria has not really transcended beyond the basic assembly of components. Uh, we haven't really, because of the nature of the industry, uh, it's like a high-tech, you know, Silicon Valley kind of technology-driven system. So you're talking about my, uh, you're talking about semiconductor chip technology. You know, the same kind of technology that is used in manufacturing phones and uh, laptops and stuff. These are the same technologies that are used to manufacture this silicon wafer. But the good news is this, and I need to say this very quickly. The good news is this. Even though as a country, we may not have advanced to the level where we can manufacture the solar cells in the country, I need to say that the, the market, the, the renewable energy industry, the solar energy industry, only 30% of the jobs that are created by that industry are localized within the factory. And, and I need to explain this a little more. 30% of the entire possibility, the entire uh, commercial capacity of the solar energy industry is within the manufacturing industry. The other 70% is out there on the field and is in the palm of our hands. So you're not going to manufacture panels, no problem. You still have 70% market share. If you can deploy these systems, manage them, provide support, that 70% is up, is up for, you, for us to grab. You know, most of the people that have come into Nigeria in the past five, six years to provide access to renewable energy, most of those people have still ended up working with local capacity, like some of the projects that have been run and finance from abroad. They still work with local capacity in terms of the installation and maintenance. So these are the areas where you can cash in on and build those R&D centers and vocational centers across the country to train people. I don't know if you have questions at this point. I'd like to take a few questions. And then based on the questions, we can uh, begin to look at some other areas which I have made and another touched in this conversation. Thank you very, very much. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you very much, our guest speaker. We are very, very grateful for this excellent presentation. Uh, I, I must confess that your presentation actually generated a lot of questions and uh, participants are interested to know quite a lot of things. So, uh, I mean, you don't need to ask. There are really many questions. So you could stop sharing your screen so that um, I will be able to be uh, guiding us through. Uh, the first question here um, for you uh, is from one of our participants and our, our, our collaborator. He says, solar energy is highly expensive in Nigeria. Solar energy is highly expensive in Nigeria. How can cost be reduced? How can cost be reduced? Let me take that question. Or do I wait? Yes, please go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. How can cost be reduced? Okay, very good. Now, I need to say this, that solar energy is a myth that solar energy is expensive. It's actually a myth. And I'm going to explain this. It's not a fact as it were. And I'm going to really explain what, what, what I'm saying. In terms of energy costs, Solar energy is the cheapest and most accessible source of energy, even in Nigeria, and in fact, in Nigeria. 
Yeah. Now, now let me explain. A single solar panel, a premium grade solar panel is supposed to last for 20 to 30 years. Okay? Now, 20 to 30 years divided by the cost of the initial installation, then you will know that you're not going to spend up to 100 naira in a month on that project, if you have to look at it. I think what the, the, the question is, is the initial cost it has. For instance, if you're going to be running your generator every day, you probably run, maybe if you're using a, a minimal generator that can power your fridge, you probably be spending like two to 3,000 naira a day. If you're going to run that generator consistently for 12 hours, and I'm going to explain this. A normal average 5 kVA generator will, um, will typically run for, for a, a normal average 5 kVA generator will typically run two, 2 liters of fuel per hour. So if you put that together for 12 hours, you're talking about 20 liters or 24 liters. At the current cost of fuel, you're spending like 3,000, you're spending like 3,000 plus or so. Now, if you spend 3,000 Naira a day on 12, in a year, you spend like 1.1 million. And you're just getting like 12 hours of, of life from that generator. Not to talk of the cost of the generator, which will cost you about 150,000. The cost of maintaining it, if you're going to be running generator that long every day, you probably have to maintain it every three weeks to one month. When you put all these costs together, you're talking a little above 1.5 million on diesel, on generator, every and this is at the very minimal level. I've met people who, after we spoke with them, they told me there's a hospital in their local. The man I met him in 2016, he said to me that he spent 300,000 naira every single month on power. One hospital in their local. We helped him with that solution by, as of today now, he doesn't spend up to 20,000 naira on diesel every month because the solar power that we saw for him runs. And so if you put that 300,000 in a month, which you were spending, you're going to be looking at an overhead of 300 times 12, 3.6 million, just on diesel. You know, I'm not talking about generator replacement. I'm not talking about the one that you sell one part more than 50,000 to go and buy a fake part. You're just in a fix. Have you ever gone to switch on a generator and the generator did not come on? And then you have something important to do, and that's all. So a lot of people now in Nigeria, they have two, three generators. All that has to, not even talk about the risk of going to show a generator and the thing explodes or backfires, storing petrol in, in your house. So you don't want somebody to steal it, don't take it to your house, store it somewhere. The risk of having children play around there, the head of explosions that burn down houses. And then you say solar is expensive. No, it's not expensive. It's just what you think it is. The initial cost, I agree, is high. Probably have to put that money together and paid one, but, but with the options that are available now, most of the, most of the companies like what we have now, we have some financing options. So you don't have to spend all that money once, they could work with some financing options, and the payment could be spread over a year or two. So solar energy, as it were, is not expensive. It's just the initial cost. If you can put that cost together, Believe me, within less than 24 months, you're going to break even and you're going to be posting profit for the next 30, 20 to 30 years. Absolutely free. The real energy is even free for God's sake. Nobody charges you for packing energy from the sun. You don't pay tax for that. I mean, it's free. You know, so, so this okay. is the okay. issue. Okay. Yeah, let's take next thank, thank, thank you, you very much. I think, I think if you want to talk about that, we, will, we won't finish today's webinar. Uh, and so the next question, I mean, before I, 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 I read out the, the next question, I would like to recognize uh, one of our professors from the Faculty of Science University of Rio, Professor Comfort Etub. Thank you very much, Ma, for joining. So the question is, uh, what is the wattage of each unit of uh, panel? What is the wattage of each unit of panel? Okay, now there are different capacities of solar panels. Um, before now, most of the capacities we had were between 200, 250, 150, 300. But right now we have up to 400 watts in the country now. You know, I'm hearing that uh, people are trying to bring in up to 500 watts. But these are the general capacities you have. You're having between 180 watts, 150 watts, some even 80 watts. 
But at the very higher level, you're talking 400 and 400 plus. Right now, we have those capacities available. Yes. Okay, so the next question I have here is what is being, what, what has been done to encourage local production of solar panels in Nigeria? Well, it's a sad story, I need to tell you. Like every other thing, it appears that there's this uh, not so sensitive approach of uh, government to some of these um, SME things. But, but the thing is this, I need to say this, um, the solar energy industry in Nigeria is still boarding and there's been uh, not so much maturity, even though I know of one of my colleagues that is actually assembling panels in Lagos, and he has gotten a lot of um, international recognition. People across the world have had one or two fintech companies trying to pull in a few millions of dollars to to drive that process locally. You know, so um, there has been this uh, this issue too. But the challenge with producing locally or this locally is that. Um, you have to now battle with the other uh, products that are invading the country, you know, how to balance profit, how to give your investors back their return on investment, and all that. So there's not been so much done. I, I, don't, I can only talk about maybe just one or two of such people that are doing stuff like that in Nigeria, but it, it's not really been um, something that I can say is um, really, really mature, right? Yes, yes in Nigeria. But I believe that with photos, right. like, you know, things will come up very strong in the future. Yeah. All right. We, we have quite a lot of questions, and we, we will keep them, and then uh, try to attend to them towards the end of uh, uh, this forum. So please bear with us. We have noted all the questions that, uh, uh, that you've sent in, but we will not treat all of them right away. So we will take a, a big pause and take a poll. Uh, so the first poll here is... Um, uh, about the solar energy system that we have. So we want to know um, uh, whether or not uh, we've been able to have any experience, maybe at home or business. So once you see the poll in front of your screen, please try to participate and then uh, we will discuss about the results. Thank you. So um, the poll is up right now. So please, uh, the question is uh, whether there is a functional solar system that is currently in use um, in your home or at your business uh, place, or maybe for public utility. And then uh, if you do not have any, you could also vote same. So please, uh, we appreciate your, your participation of, uh, in this poll. So I'll end the poll in the next few seconds. All right. So we have here about 21% uh, said they have um, solar energy system at home, while about seven answered and said they have at uh, their business places 10% uh, uh, have noted some being used uh, for public utility. And then the others, we have 7%, and then none, 55%, and that is huge. So I would like to ask our guest speaker today to, to quickly you know, respond to these um, uh, 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 questions, uh, sorry, answers. Okay, okay. Um, it's typical of what we see every day. There's this, um, Cold footiness. Could you please switch on my video? I, I want to. I'm not. I'm not able to switch on my video. Um, so there's this um, slowness of people to adapt to this technology. So I can. I'm not surprised at this poll because this is really a reflection of. Um, this is really a reflection of um, what what is really uh, going on in the country. But I hope that with conversations like this, 
there, there, there's going to be an improvement. More people are even solar in their home because there's no other way out. But most of the time, they consider businesses as something that you can always uh, use generator for a few minutes. But when you get home and you really get hot, you need to really um, find a way out. And, and I hope that if we have this meeting in the next five years, we should have some much more, you know, better output. But, but you know, the good news, I'm happy with this poll result because by the time we go back home, this 55% will now begin to seem different. And, and you know, this is why we actually call this meeting so that there could be an improvement. Exactly. exactly. So, I, I think it's really great. It's really good. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, we would like to we would like to move on to the next speaker for today. Um, we would bring in our distinguished professor, Professor Idara Kwabio, will be speaking to us very shortly. He's here with us today. So he will be talking on the topic um, uh, solar energy in COVID nineteen. I mean, a way of also. Um, you know, uh, giving some speech and remarks about what has been discussed so far, bringing in the university and R&D experience. So uh, a brief about Professor Idara Pavio. He is the Dean, Faculty of Science, University of Yo. He has been a professor for over 10 years. He holds a PhD degree in applied geophysics from University of Science and Technology, Port Harcourt. He has professional experience that has taken him through the geological laboratory, and Exploration Department of Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria, XPDC, Stanford University, California, Southern Polytechnic State University, Atlanta, Georgia. Professor Claudio is the coordinator of the Advanced Space Technology Applications Laboratory in Yale. Professor Claudio is a member of several professional organizations, including Nigerian Institute of Physics, Nigerian Mining and Geosciences Society, and Nigerian Association of Petroleum Explorationists. He has authored and published over 100 articles in reputable national and international journals. Professor, we are very, very happy that you've been able to uh, join us today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I will be stop, I'll stop sharing my screen now so that you could share yours and uh, let us hear from you. Thank you very much, Prof. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Okay, a lot has been said on the solar energy in the COVID-19 economy, and a lot has also been said on impact of COVID-19 on economy. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is that arising from the challenges that we have had over the months this year precisely uh, because of the COVID, there are lots and lots of challenges that exist now in the solar energy industry. And such challenges should be faced up or should be looked at as opportunities to, to the researchers. I don't really want to repeat what has been said already, but let me just make a few one or two remarks on the, uh, what has been discussed. For example, somebody asked a question that uh, solar energy uh, harnessing is expensive and I want to say, yes, it is expensive at the installation point. My advice to people that are interested in keying into solar energy business uh, from the functional solar energy system uh, quiz that has been made, over 55% said none. In other words, they, have, they are not aware of what is going on. So a lot of awareness has to be put in place, has to be made so that people will know that solar energy is cheap Solar energy is clean, cheap. By cheap, I mean, if you start small, you don't need to start in a scale that uh, has been so bogus the way the clean energy guy presented it. You can get solar energy in your house, in your office. You can start with mere simple lighting. If you start with lighting up points alone, you can, you can get that cheap. As time progresses, you can now go to fan. As time progresses, you add maybe panel, increase your capacity in terms of battery, so you now advance to uh, getting it into your freezer. Bit by bit, you add up and add up and add up. And before you know it, you have assembled a large KBA that can take you, that can even take your, your, your AC. 
one AC is enough for a, for, for a period. So my advice is that we can start, one can start small, start small by taking the lighting point and then you increase and increase and increase. I, at the long run, at the very, very long run, you will see that solar energy in your house is the cheapest that you can get anywhere. You cannot compare it with buying fuel, by the servicing of your generator and all of that. It's important to note that once you get solar energy installed in your house, little or no servicing is required, less maintenance. Uh, I, I always like to, to educate people that I, I, I get involved in terms of solar energy installations. I get them involved. I show them simple, simple things that they can do. So that if a bulb, if a solar energy bulb gets bad, you don't raise alarm and say this thing is bad. We'll show you how to replace them, how to get them fixed. And that way you are part of it and you will enjoy it. Now, I want to say also that um, the impact of COVID-19 has been very serious. Early in 2020, the price of oil fell due to the oil price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia. That is well documented. And so, we are aware that the corona pandemic worsened the situation through the reduction in the demand for oil. The imposed travel restrictions during the pandemic led to a reduction in the movement of people and goods. And that invariably resulted in the aviation where the demand came low. Coal and other energy products were subsequently devastated. And so we have seen clearly that businesses were closed, were locked down, there were devaluation in currency, procurement challenges for imported products were all locked down. In Nigeria precisely, about 55% of the population lack access to grid connected electricity. And so what do we need to do? What are the opportunities that exist? I have said earlier that the challenges faced in the industry will now be seen as opportunities. Now, we cannot manufacture, for example, the photovoltaic cells that are used in manufacturing the, the panels. But what can we do? We can be involved in the assembly. We can be involved in the fabrication. Just like the guy in the clean energy said, only about 30% are useful in the manufacturing. A whole lot of 70% is involved in assembling and fabrication. Who knows, in the course of fabrication and assembling, something good can come out of it. So this is where the university partnership with the industry is important. So where the industry have challenges, the university researchers take that as opportunity. And before you know it, something good will surely come out of it. So my challenge now is that, Industry should be kind enough to get researchers involved so that we take part in studying critically the components that are essential in the fabrication, the components that are essential in the assembly. Now, those are the panels. I, I read somewhere in one of the questions, uh, somebody said that uh, Akwai Boom or this part of the country that uh, we, we won't really enjoy solar energy because of our weather. That's fine and true. If we increase our capacity, we increase our battery storage so that once every uh, power comes in there and gets stored, in the night we can use it. So we must also direct our attention and research in the area of power storage. Now we are going into lithium production of batteries. So a lot has to be done in the assembling and fabrication of the panels, the inverters, the different components in the inverters, we have to study them critically and see which part we can assemble or which part we can manufacture here, the batteries, the charge controllers, and all the accessories that go with the battery panel. This way, we can be sure of making an impact. I, I really enjoy what the clean energy guy is doing. I, I pray and I sincerely wish that the, the industry and the, the academia will join together and see how we can enlarge that scope. The opportunities that exist here include supporting medical teams in remote areas where solar energy is in abundance. It is abundant everywhere. So we don't need to, it doesn't matter where you are, solar energy can be tapped. Now the off-grid project 
being more preferred by investors. Example, the federal government to provide solar energy to over 5 million Nigerians within a month. It can, it's possible. And then in several businesses, in the food industry, in the security industry, all over power, solar energy industry, we can harness everything and make sure that solar energy is used in abundance. Now, I have mentioned the research opportunities that exist. In our laboratories, we can study critically the photovoltaic cells, the semiconductors, the, the, the cells that are used in assembling the semiconductors, and then we see how best the researchers can make use of it. They turn film solar, they buy facial solar models. All these are done, and we can make a lot of research in our laboratories, and then with the assistance and the, the, the knowledge that the industry or the challenges that the industries face, they bring it up to us and we study this and make something good out of this. With all of this, I'm sure at the end of the day, we will have something very useful. I want to thank the, the energy, the clean energy guy for what he has, he's doing. He's doing a great work and I, I really enjoy it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor, for that excellent presentation. Uh, just to uh, re-emphasize what Prof has said, he has really uh, given us some tips on how to, you know, collaborate uh, uh, between uh, universities and the industry in driving uh, cleaner and sustainable energy. Thank you very much, Prof, for that. So before we go on, we we'll just like to take just uh, one question for Prof. And, 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 and the question is, um, I have not found any way to buy photovoltaic cells in Nigeria for my solar projects and research. Any suggestions? So maybe after that, other questions will be answered uh, through the live chat, or uh, we will send them to you because there are so many questions for profit. Let's just attend to this one. Prof, did you get the questions? Hello? Look. No, I'm with you. Okay. The, the question is, I have not found any way to buy photovoltaic cells in Nigeria for my solar projects and research. Do you have any suggestions? Okay. If, um... If the person goggles, if I goggle, I can give you a few places that you can buy. If I do oh. a goggle, you can, I can give a few, a few places that one can buy, very few. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Prof. We will now move on, uh, forward to um, another speaker uh, for today. We will consider a, a PhD research from our university so we'll invite Emmanuel Usa to briefly present his research. Emmanuel Usa, are you there? Hello? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Please, could you share your screen and let us, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Okonosa, <clears throat> research student with physics department. I've carefully listened to the first speaker and also that of the prof. It was very of interest to us in the department to now see how to close this gap. First was <clears throat> the bulkiness of the investor system the heaviness of the barracks, this project has been able to solve that. And the overall outcome of this project has made electricity to be mobile, available, and sustainable for the end users. Permit me to take you through the system.
The main objectives of these studies was to design, implement, and evaluate smart modular integrated solar and wind energy system. A system overview, you can harness electric energy from the solar and also from the wind. Here in this country, we have those potential for those two sources of energy. We needed to develop this system that can harness those resources and produce electricity. We will be made available for all the devices you've seen on your right side. Eventually, we were able to have this system, which weighs about 23 kg. It could be carried along to anywhere. And it can be easily plugged. You can easily plug your solar panel and off you go. By the other side, you then you take off to your load. All what we've been talking about the solar system, it must be available. The energy must be available for the end user. I'm assuring everyone that this is possible by this system. So let's play a scenario where we are using this system. If I set aim and objective of having power is to power a house, which other utilities, equipment, and devices are being used there, can we achieve it? I think that's the essence of this discussion. Can we achieve it? Is it possible? The answer is positively yes, it's possible. We can. This is the perfect world that we want to be. And how would this impact our economy, our SME, who happened to use that house for his, maybe a bathing saloon, maybe other businesses, provided there's availability of electricity, I think the person can enjoy it, the economy. What if case scenario occurs, a rainy day, Now we don't have sun. Just like the prop said, people said, in this part of the country, we might not get it right. I, I dismiss it. Because when you look at your meteorological service and do the necessary calculation, that will help you to size your solar panel, size your wind generator to get to the power you need from the source to be able to power your inverter system. And this we have done and we have achieved it. A sunny day, then your solar system, like we're going into this dry season, excellent, excellent production at all times. And it's feeding it through your inverter system, and the home is going. What about night? Where those two sources are not available. A good battery system, like the early speaker mentioned. We have more from the uh, elite acid battery technology to a lithium battery system. This, you achieve two things there, fast charging. And then we incorporate communication because the end user, if you look at your right hand side, is the one receiving. Unlike conventional, inverter system which the owner has to go to the place to see if the battery is charging is it healthy enough with your handset you can always be in touch with your system so we have box both communication and with the inverter system and this is now becoming portable and you can move it from one place to the another place and they require energy based on the sizing and the capacity and be made available for the end user, which is the needed power to drive the economy and the needed power to
to communicate your product, your services to other end users. This has been developed and we look forward for partnership and possible training and retraining of our teaming population. I think this will go a long way to close this gap in this post COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank My you, name is Emmanuel Osa. Yeah, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for that excellent presentation. Um, we will send your own questions to you to answer. Please, if you have questions, you put it in the Q&A and then Emmanuel will be able to answer uh, you. Uh, but right now we want to take the last poll. So please um, attendees, please pay attention. The question is the most important aspect of solar energy technology that research and development should address is what? So please kindly provide your comments, uh, sorry, your answers, and then we will wrap it up with that before we finally close. And we are very sorry for, you know, taking a little bit of your time. Uh, we hope to, you know, uh, enjoy this last part as we close. Thank you. You didn't go. You went. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll right now. Um, so here is the result. We have 67% um, um, responded and said that storage uh, is the most important. The other 22% said uh, panels and the other 7% inverters and then four other percent said others. So I don't know if Prof um, has something to say about this uh, poll result. Prof. Akpabi, please. Okay, thank you. The, the poll result shows uh, a very practical and realizable result. I'm saying that because storage is, for me, the most important. Because if you have enough, enough storage system, you can, if the weather is, is poor, you can still have light in your house. You don't really need an inverter to have light. If you, you can have uh, connect a DC, if you connect DC, you, you have light. You don't really need um, an inverter. So storage is very important. The, the panel is equally important, but storage is the most important. That, that view, I, I, I accept it totally. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, at this juncture, we would like to thank all of you for joining in today to attend today's industry um, university uh, forum. The second in the series, we want to thank the guest speaker for today, Mr. Wobasunu. Thank you very much, sir. We also would like to thank our professor and Dean of Faculty of Science, Professor Idara Babio. Please thank you very much for attending today's session and being able to provide us with such uh, insights. And we'd also like to give our most gratitude to the host center, the International Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability Research for giving us this opportunity to interact with industry. We thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Nephew of SCN San for providing the resources and facilities in our university to host this webinar. We also like to thank all the professors in attendance that, uh, that, that, that you know, provided some support. I mean, it means to us that what we are doing is really important. We thank the technical team we look, we look forward to another opportunity to meet with you. But before we close this session, I would like to share with you uh, some important information um, that you need uh, to know. And that is, um, hold on a sec. The, the information about the industry survey, I hope you all can see my screen. So please, this is very important for all of us here. Please do well to visit our website or visit this link to fill out that form. We also like to inform all participants that we will send out certificate of attendance to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, and the, 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 the live recording of this event will be available on our YouTube channel. And so please feel free to contact us anytime for more information. Thank you very much. I don't know if the director has anything to say. I would like to wrap it up at this point in time. Thank you very much. 
Yes, please, just to join in thanking everybody. And please, can the technical team, can you unmute, um, can you allow everybody have um, access to video so that we can do it and um, we can snap? Please. Technical okay, please, team. Yeah, yeah, please, can you all, um, uh, you know, um, allow your video so that we can take a group photograph? Prof. Imam yes, I'm on. Sa Okay. Prof, could you could you switch on your video, please? Okay, Emmanuel Osa is there. Prof, Inam, your video is still off. Please, I don't have access. You cannot start. The host has stopped. The host has stopped my video. Please, can this host on or allow everybody? Okay, 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 okay. I've done that. I've done that, please. I've done that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you can smile and say cheese. <laughs> 